Hey, how's it going? Welcome back to the End Poem Podcast. Call it Season 2 if you like. I took some much-needed time off over the holidays. But this is a show where I sit down for career-spanning interviews with folks who make video games in a variety of disciplines and at different stages of their careers. I'm Alex James Kane, author of the Boss Fight Books entry on Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic. I've written for places like Fangoria Magazine, IGN, Polygon, RogerEbert.com, Rolling Stone, the official Star Wars blog, and Variety. It's a strange time for the games industry and for entertainment at large. People who do creative work for a living are kind of going through it right now, and anyone who appreciates art shares in that pain. Anti-labor sentiment and all the awful things happening in the world uh, with the looming threat of so-called generative AI and an unprecedented number of layoffs and studio closures. So for a little context, the interviews for this show were conducted over a period of a few months, primarily the summer of 2023, just before the big Hollywood strikes. And because at least two of the folks in this second batch of episodes are actors involved with television, I decided to hold their episodes a lot longer than I might have otherwise out of solidarity with the unions. I'm in a union myself, which is probably the only reason I made it through the past year with a job. Today's episode is, I believe, the first interview I did for this entire project. I was very rusty, supremely nervous, and probably focused on some of the wrong things. But I wanted to get to know the guy in a way games journalists typically avoid in interviews like this. Had he been involved with my book five or six years earlier, I certainly would have asked different questions. But he was working at Microsoft at that time, and I never managed to get a hold of him through PR channels. Anyway, my guest today is Casey Hudson, one of the key creative figures behind such landmark games as Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic from 2003, the original Mass Effect trilogy, Neverwinter Nights, and Jade Empire. He served as general manager at BioWare during the final stretch of development on Anthem, and more recently has been running his own studio, Humanoid Origin, and spinning up a new game project over there. It was such an honor and a privilege to talk to Casey again for the show. I first met him a few years ago in person up at Bioware Edmonton for a Polygon article. Here's me talking to Casey Hudson. I made the foolish mistake of assuming technology would just work if you plug it in. So <laughs> Yeah, like sometimes it does. And then I guess it's like the beauty, it's the double-edged sword of being able to do this kind of stuff, right? Like, yeah. did you just come from like the office or did you like work from home today or how's that work? Yeah, this is my office lately. We, we do have an office here in Edmonton and then another one in Kelowna. So we have offices. I tend to work from home quite a bit, partly out of convenience and, you know, partly because we're not quite set up yet for everybody in our current office, but it's great. It's flexible and some people can't work from home. So if some people choose to work from there. So yeah, this is where I was today. And uh, nice, nice. But it's good because now maybe that's what I'll, I'll use for meetings if this actually works and sounds better. Cool. Yeah. So you've like had a lot of changes to your work situation, just like everybody else uh, in the last couple of years. Yeah, we is one of the things I realized it was very strange for everybody, of course, but I was the studio head for Bioware when COVID hit and everyone kind of went home and it was very surreal, but I was sitting here in my home office and I was the general manager for a studio of several hundred people and it kind of worked pretty well. And then it just makes you realize that if that's possible, then maybe you don't need the big infrastructure and the huge studio locations. Maybe there's a different way to do it. Nice, nice. Yeah. So you kind of see all just that, like a lot of the sort of the newer generation of devs coming into the industry see probably. So I mean, I'm yeah. sure that's very nice for people here, you say. Mm-hmm. So those are both in Canada then. You yeah. got like Edmonton pretty close in this sort of in province. Yeah, the other one's in BC and not too 
too far from Vancouver, but those are just the actual physical studio locations that we have. And then we have people sort of throughout Canada and the US, UK. Yeah. Nice. So one of the weird questions that I was going to ask you as I was leafing through the Bioware coffee table book, <laughs> of course, there's all those old photos. And in one of them, I think you have like, you got your hair bleached blonde. Is that right? I don't, was that oh, you? you know what? That's not me. Oh, okay. I, I know that picture, and that was probably okay. from an MDK2 launch party, I think. Okay. I think that was someone on the team who looked a lot like me. Okay. But I've never had bleach blonde hair, so... I, I, I know that that wouldn't be me. Yeah. <laughs> That's very funny. Yeah. I was like, I wonder if he's like a music guy because of that. And then I was, I saw the keyboard there and I was like, I wonder, you know, is the keyboard, is that your thing? Like a, a blow you know, off steam kind of hobby? Or? I love, uh, my whole thing is I just, I love to find out how people do magic and like art is magic to me. See an incredible image that somebody can paint. How did they do that? But the same is true for programming. Like, it is real magic to write a set of commands and think about an algorithm and then debug it. And once it's working, it feels like you've really created something. And so across all of these different disciplines, that's always been my fascination. It is all magical in what people are doing. So I always look at that and think, if I could do that, if I could play that guitar riff or learn how someone did something in Photoshop, then I too would be able to create magic for people. And I don't ever go as deep or have the kind of talent people do in each of these individual areas. But then this process also kind of gives me a, a view into what everybody does and what their challenges are, and then how we can pull those things together into a complete project. Yeah. So almost like the discomfort of trying something like a way for you to touch with, with that and, and sort of take a step back from the fact that you've been doing this for 20, 25 years, right? Is that kind of uh, yeah, well, it's, how that it's, works? And it's always been there. Like I like to be in there with the team helping to solve problems. And even if like I'm working with the art director on trying to crack a tricky concept, yeah, even if I'm not going to make art that's nearly as good as the art director, I still want to be in there trying to solve visual problems and creating art that I can share or, you know, a sketch or like trying to do that kind of visual problem solving. But then likewise, the same thing across music and animation and things like that. I like to be in there and understanding how the engine works and how blueprint something. I think it's really important to not just have the words and go through the motions, but to be trying to do all of these things. And it's also just a passion. Like I, I love of the idea of learning something and uh, being able to, to do a little bit of all the different disciplines that there are in games. Nice. Nice. Another thing that I was leafing through that book and just trying to refresh myself with like, what is it beyond the sort of KOTOR Mass Effect anthem sort of window that I have like the most intimacy with? And it, one thing that really surprised me was some of your concept sketches in there are really good. I feel like people would be surprised at how, you know, like you're a really competent concept concept artist with your style is kind of like Doug Chang. Have you ever heard that? I, well, I, yeah. I haven't heard that. <laughs> I think that the ability that I have is sort of like the ability to adapt, to get good enough at something to solve the problem of the day, you know? And so sure. at, at times I might spend a lot of time in Photoshop and like drawing, like when we were starting Mass Effect, I was really concerned with, um, you know, the Citadel and what what is going to be the shape of this. And so I was just doing tons of drawing and trying to find like, what is that going to look like? But then, you know, the fun of that is then working with someone who's really talented, you know, like Derek Watts on Mass Effect. And, you know, he might see something that I'm doing and create something incredible out of it. And then we have something to talk about. And so I've always just really loved that way of working and having a little bit more of a connection to what people are trying to solve for in their craft. Yeah, you guys, uh, you never had any shortage of good artists. And uh, it looks like the new studio has the same thing going for it. So that's kind of cool to see. I was thinking about that, the White Avenue um, anecdotes, you know, people talk about like sort of the old Bioware culture of like going out and dancing and like there's all these what is like med students and stuff like that and i'm like it kind of gives the feeling of like terrace or the citadel dlc like that kind of like neon cold metal <laughs> But, but also like <laughs> bars in life and almost like Coruscant. Did you guys think, is there a way to put White Avenue in the games or, or was that something that you think happened or? I think um, 
Yeah, it's a, it's an interesting question. I think it might even be <laughs> it might even be a little bit the opposite, where many of us at a early days of Bioware we worked on White Ave, and that's kind of where just downstairs from us were like that's where all the bars and restaurants were, and then many of us lived within walking distance of there. So mm-hmm. we would kind of go to work. Work was kind of most of our life at the time. And then even if you wanted to go out and meet your friends at the bar or whatever, they were just downstairs or across the street. And, you know, it's not a lifestyle that you want to maintain into your 30s and 40s, but um, that's kind of what it was like at that time. But because it was so, I think it was like a really narrow existence in a lot of ways, and half of it is in the winter, bitterly cold outside, that we then, first of all, have a lot of time to focus and imagine something But also you then really start thinking of like, what does the escape look like? Where would you want to be right now instead of in the middle of the winter in Edmonton working 12 hours a day? Where would you, you know, what, what do you, what do you fantasize about? And then that I think is kind of what propels a lot of the vision for these really epic places and a sense of escapism. Yeah. I think about both KOTOR and Mass Effect 1 kind of end on these like beaches Sort of like Rogue, <laughs> like Rogue One did, right? Like that mm-hmm. sort of tropical uh, palm tree, but with like a Sith temple in the middle of it. So that's kind of funny to think about. Like you're just mm-hmm. getting as far away from Edmonton as you can. Yeah, this is the vacation that we plan for at the end of the project. They were just <laughs> just trying to get there. Yeah, the only time I ever left the country, yeah, America, the United States, was to go play Anthem pre-release. And uh, I got there. I'm like, well, this looks exactly like where I live, thousands of miles away. Yeah. Plus, it's like a little bit colder. Uh, but very, very little difference. Um, it's very true. So this thing about you wanted to be like a fighter pilot once upon a time mm-hmm. is interesting. And I, I saw that you somebody had finally kind of made that Top Gun connection in the opening. Yeah. The opening text that's sort of like the pilots call it Top Gun. And then Mass Effect is like the civilizations of the galaxy call it Mass Effect. And so that took people like 15 years to crack that code. Is that kind of what you noticed? That's funny. Mm-hmm. But you, that was sort of your dream before you started fooling around with computers then? Yeah, when I when I was a teenager, I was just really, I think as many people are, really anxious about like, what what's my life going to be like? And so I better try to envision the best thing that I can imagine doing and just really go for that. And then maybe the different offshoots of that might be pretty good too. So the most amazing thing I could think of to aim for is becoming an astronaut. Sure. And there was a Canadian astronaut that I knew about at the time, who's now even more famous, Chris Hadfield. And he was an astronaut and I was able to sort of look at what he had done in terms of a series of little steps that seemed each of them, you know, ambitious, but it seemed achievable. And so it's basically, uh, you know, in Canada, you join the Air Cadet as a young teenager, you kind of work your way through, you get a flying scholarship, earn your pilot's license through Air Cadets, engineering degree in university, become a military pilot, test pilot, and then astronaut. And so that was kind of like the ladder that I was clinging to. If I just like focus on these steps, then maybe I'll get somewhere great. And also the offshoots of that are good too. Like what if you become an engineer? Or what if you end up as a pilot and you don't go as far as being an astronaut? Those are all great, great outcomes. So that was my plan. But also, while I was working that plan, I was also doing a ton of like computer programming and art and music just because that's what I love to do. So when I graduated, I did the first of those a few steps, air cadets, pilot's license, you know, got a degree in engineering. And then as I graduated, I was looking at that next step, which is you join the military and become a pilot. But I also had an engineering degree. And at the time, there had been a hiring freeze on military pilots in Canada. And they were just opening that back up, but it wasn't as strong an option as it had been in earlier years. And at the same time, I had an engineering degree, and maybe I should look at what engineering jobs there are. And then also just maybe a month or two before I graduated, I found out that there was a company in Edmonton that was making video games, Bioware. And so I had these three paths, and they all kind of came down to one week where I had a decision point that I had to uh, make all within kind of the space of of a week, which way I was going to go. And I ended up joining Bioware because I felt like in the engineering path or in the aviation path, those kind of used a subset of what I can do and what I like to do. But I saw in games the opportunity to use everything, 
like the engineering, the project management, math and physics and programming and art and music, you can use all of it. And I felt like, first of all, that could be a lot of fun, but also I just had all these levers to pull to build a career out of. So it was a little bit of a bet, yeah. a little experiment. But yeah, it, it worked out really well. You know, Bioware was amazing. It was just an incredible time to be making games at a time when things were very, even at that time, which was by no means near the beginning of the game industry is like late 90s. Um, it's still, you know, obviously a long time ago from now. And things were very new. And almost anything that you did might be the first time people were doing it because everybody's working with 3D for the first time or everyone's working with physics for the first time. So the things that you would experiment with during the day might be brand new to the world. And it was super exciting. Were you coming from sort of like Super Nintendo world or were you coming from kind of PC? Like as a player? Yeah, like as like you're kind of... Yeah, so um, I, I've always loved video games um but i kind of played them sort of like the way i watch movies and do other things is it's partly the entertainment aspect but i'm also trying to unwind how it's being done so i didn't play everything and i didn't get excited about all the different games it was when one of them in particular really caught my imagination and then i would play it like crazy but also really try to figure out how they did it so i think i kind of i was probably more on sort of the pc side in the years ahead of joining bioware so i loved the adventure games and like space quest this is going back a long time now but text adventures characters that actually reacted to you know what you do and you say like uh, planetfall was incredible to me and i think people who played planetfall back in the day all kind of had the same experience which is that there's a character in that makes you cry at the end and for people at that time playing a text adventure on a early pc the idea of a character making you cry is just profound and you realize the power of the medium and then another one to me was uh, starflight where it is a procedurally generated galaxy of stars and every star has planets and every planet has a surface you can go down on the surface and drive around and it's got terrain and it was all on like one floppy disk because it was procedural and that is an incredible magic trick like how did they do that so just playing it but really trying to back engineer how it's done so that I can then imagine that I could apply these things to do something of my own at some point. Nice. It, it might be because of the nature of video games and like wanting combat. But one of the things that kind of sets Mass Effect from like Star Wars, you know, any of that or whatever you want to kind of compare it to, it's almost like this horror element, right? Like these sort of Lovecraftian Leviathans and the Geth. And, and the the husks, uh, Saren, and sort of just these body horror things that are sometimes subtle, but they do horrify us if we stop to think about them. Did did you sort of come from horror movies to some extent when you're thinking about like, oh, we need to have these reapers and have them be you know as terrifying as they kind of are. You know, I think it comes from maybe I would say two things. One of them is we really envisioned Mass Effect as imagine that there was. Uh, a movie that came out in the late 70s or early 80s that was kind of in the vein of Star Trek The Wrath of Khan or Alien. And it was like a major science fiction hit that just didn't get released. And now you get to like play it, you get to be in that experience. And so that's kind of where we went with not necessarily horror, but that, susp that sort of sci-fi suspense feeling. And then I think the other piece was we were just really swinging for the fences. Yeah. Like... If there's a threat, what is the biggest threat? And if if you're going to make decisions in this game, let's make them agonizing decisions of the highest stakes. Yeah. And so Mass Effect kind of has this feeling like of everything being big and important and difficult choices and huge scale. And uh, I think that's where it came from. You had that scrapped work on Neverwinter Nights where you said you did like all these creature models and then like 99% of them ended up just getting thrown in the, the trash. What, what was that like as a creator? Like, how did you sort of grapple with that sort of ego death that, that that must have been for you at that time? Yeah, it's so strange because I don't remember being particularly upset about it. I remember, so when I started at Bioware on the very first day, they gave me a concept for a giant spider and I started working in 3D Studio Max and by you know 5 p.m. I had made some progress on it. That was my first day. And so my 
first week, I made this spider monster model. And then for the rest of, you know, I'd say that whole first year, I was just doing all, uh, a lot of characters and, and creatures, mostly characters, for Neverwinter Nights. I started as a 3D modeler, but the hope was that because I had an engineering degree that I would become a technical artist. And that's what I quickly moved into as well. I had a list of all the 3D models that I was working through, but as much as I could, I was also doing technical art stuff. So I would sit down with people and just be amazed to watch them work as an animator or a, a programmer and things. But then I would notice things that I realized were kind of slowing them down. And I would go back to my desk and write a tool and then come back and say like, hey, instead of having to press 26 buttons to do a step that you have to do every day, click here. And it just gets done in one step. And I would try and build tools and things like that. And then I was also, I had taken the, uh, just the basic graphic engine, the model viewer that we had. So I could take a character that I had modeled, put it in the model viewer and see it in our actual engine instead of 3D Studio Max. But then I realized if I could tell it to play an animation, then I could also bring in like a floor and then play a walk animation. And then I could tell it to move. And then I just kind of started layering and it started to become a prototype of the whole game where you could click on the you'd have an environment mar model, you could click on the ground, the character would walk over there, all the animations. And so I was building like a whole prototype of the Neverwinter Nights game. And that's what we actually took to demos at like Gen Con and things. And the early screenshots were actually from the that prototype as opposed to the proper game engine. So I was kind of working on all of those kinds of things. And then after about a year of doing that and working on all these character models, um, I think it was the Dungeons and Dragons third edition rules came out and it had concepts for how things were supposed to look. And I believe what happened was we were asked to just snap to those concepts. So all of these character models that I had made were just never going to get used. And then the irony of it is the one thing that did end up getting used was the giant spider model, which I did in my first day or two uh, working at Bioware. I don't remember being that upset about it. And maybe it was because on some level, I just kind of understood like decisions get made and this is going to happen. But on the other hand, I was just excited to have learned and used them for practice essentially. And But also I was doing a lot of other things. I think if it had been the only work that I had done in that time, then I would feel like, wow, like a whole year of my life was gone. So maybe that's why I was not you know, overly upset about it is we were building all of these other things, the whole prototype and lots of other technical art stuff that I was involved. In. So it was very much having several and several baskets as opposed to just, but that, like that was a stressful time, right? Neverwinter Nights. That was sort of like a, a dark moment for Bioware. Or were you sort of blissfully out of the line on some of that stuff? Or do you recall it was kind of like the publisher was going bankrupt at one point and you guys had to sort of uh, deal with that? Well, you know, and, and this is something that I reflect on more and more now that I'm, you know, CEO for an independent studio and the way that Greg and Ray would have been at the time is um, they were very good at providing an environment that not only felt stable because they were shielding us from a lot of the existential crisis that, you know, any business and especially an indie game company at that time would have been experiencing. It not only felt stable, but they did, they provided real stability, you know, and the games that we worked on for many years, everything we worked on shipped and became a good game that brought revenue into the studio and elevated our status as a developer. But I know that it was a lot rougher waters than what we would have experienced. Yeah. And, um, you know, I'm always curious to follow up with Greg and Ray and, you know, find out more of what that would have been like sure. for them. Yeah. Um, there was sort of that, that period, things got a little more exploratory, right? And, and there, there were some canceled projects, but it was probably most Dragon Age, right? Like when you guys were going with the idea of uh, sort of like Jade Empire 2's like secret agent thing, that was all fairly far along, right? Yeah. And at that point, we had, uh, we were becoming larger as a studio and growing the number of projects we had at a given time. Yeah, I think at one point there was there was just more projects than we could sustain in terms of focus and even just the logistics of getting that many things done. And prior to that, though, it's we had an amazing run of just it was very rare to be able to ship everything that you work on. And I think we had that for quite a while. Yeah. And I mean, like the Baldur's Gates and KOTOR and all that, it was all very massively received, right? I mean, it was, it was mm -hmm. all kind of really atypical for a lot of those really ambitious games back then to, yeah. to do that well for that long. Does it feel a little bit like traveling back in time now that you, so you've got your own, your own studio that you essentially run, right? As opposed to running a studio that is part of this like corporation that has a sort of 
portfolio style? Does it feel a little bit more like the Wild West era of Bioware to be in this kind of new phase of the career? Well, I think what we're trying to create is a little bit of that sense of those early days where really there's nothing to distract you from making a great game because it's kind of amazing in a way. If you work in the game industry right now, you probably have the experience of many, many things that you do during the day that are not working on the actual game. And it's that I think is kind of amazing to reflect on in those times when there wasn't anything else and everyone all day was only working on the game. And so we're trying to recreate aspects like that while also applying the fact that, you know, so many of us have shipped multiple AAA games. And hopefully there are learnings from that that we can then use to do things smarter or faster or not end up doing crunch time and you know, not end up working on things that need to be downscoped. And like, there's a lot of things that you learn in making games that hopefully we can apply to just have smoother productions, mostly, you know, just a place that we all want to work in because it's got a fantastic culture and we're organized enough that even though making games is really, really hard, we have fun doing it and look forward to going to work every day. I mean, you've got this like fantastic talent pool out there now, and it's, you know, definitely a contrast to like, you know, Sort of, oh, I walked out of college and got hired at Bioware or Bethesda, like some of the stories that you hear, you know, kind of like yours in some ways. Did you have KOTOR stuff that you wanted to talk about? Well, yeah, a little bit. I kind of wanted to not totally dwell on KOTOR the whole time, but did, you know, a couple sort of KOTOR Mass Effect questions were things like uh, one of my favorite video game locations ever is uh, that Jedi Enclave on Dantooine. And if you look at the concept art in that scrapbook, Mm -hmm. it seems like it's a curated view into the concept art. But did that come from a pretty specific vision of what you guys wanted that to look like? Do you remember like that place taking shape as like, okay, we want this sort of grassy, sun-drenched, you know? Yeah, well, I think uh, that's the other thing that I've reflected on a lot is, you know, taking previous projects and remembering what worked well and what didn't work well about them and sort of putting myself back in that mindset. And I think the interesting thing about the way we worked on KOTOR was it was very fast. And it's because of the people that were involved, it were extremely to the point. They knew what they wanted. They articulated it. We did it. And then we moved on. And so like uh, Drew Carpishan was the writer. And so he might think of if we're going to go to Dantooine, what happens there? What's it like? And so very clear about this is how it's going to be. And James Olin, the lead designer, likewise, okay, here are the different areas. Here's the drawings of the different maps that you'll go to. Here's what the quests are going to be. And then likewise, Derek Watts, he would be able to take that, do a concept. You look at the first concept and go, that's it. Like no notes. And it's so much of it went that way. So I think Dantooine is an example where it seems like it's sort of cherry picked to where like if you look at the concept art, it matches the game so well that you think it's almost like a, a painting of the game. But it literally was, I think the way Derek worked at the time was we still worked on like pencil and vellum paper. And so he would do a drawing, we, we, we would look at it. And so often it was spot on. And then he would take it into Photoshop and paint the color version. And I think that's it. Like I, he had a few of those for a few of the different areas of Dantooine. Um, he came up with that sort of poured concrete look for the structures and the grassy landscape and the sort of sunset view. And we just work really quickly that way. Oh, you were talking about work-life balance and and just the way the industry has kind of matured to sort of prevent crunch and kind of uh, keep the scope under control. Like one of the things that you notice when you sort of look at old video game credits versus now like just the sheer number of producers like there might be like two three producers or you know somebody will say like oh we didn't really have producers at our studio back then but you know you pull up the credits for like the last mm-hmm. of us part two and there's you know how is that like do you see your job as similar to producer job these days like that's something that is like to keeping a project get an independent studio that is sort of going for big scale is that kind of the, the secret like the way the producers work now versus you know, pre all the technology and software. Yeah. Well, on KOTOR, I was the project director, which meant producer and director for the game overall. And then we had a line producer. And then I think there were other line producers in Bioware that uh, helped out as well. But I, 
I was able to do like maintain the whole schedule for the project and what each person was doing on different weeks and things like that because the team size was around 72 at the peak. And at that size, it's a lot, but it's actually manageable for one person if you know, again, like, unfortunately, it's just we worked crazy hours. So for me, it was manageable, given that I work way too much, but there is a knowable scope there. And you can walk through the office and talk with folks during the day about what they're doing and kind of have the whole thing in your head. That's what we're trying to somewhat recreate in Humanoid is a core team that is around that 75 number just in terms of full-time internal staff, but being well-funded enough to go out and then scale that up and have partners and co-developers and things like that so that we can go out and do uh, a game of a larger scope than you could otherwise do. But that team size, I think, is important because after that, it is no longer knowable by one person. And then you really do need to divide it up into pillars and have pillar producers and various leads among them. Then you have lots of challenges in terms of communication between different groups inside one project. So now my role currently, because I'm also the CEO, it's a little bit different because there's CEO aspects to what I do. And so we do have producers partly because of that and also because the scale of what we're doing is actually much, much bigger and more complicated than KOTOR was. And then you really do need lots of big brains on the overall logistics of the operation. Sure. So you do kind of see it as, as trying to maintain scope that people kind of think of when they, you know, oh, Casey Hudson's founded the studio and he's doing a new sci-fi thing To Like, are you thinking of bringing over things like the romance elements of those Bioware games, things like that? Is that sort of a focus that you are still interested in or are you about uh, more vehicles and the exploration or are you uh, able to say anything like about sort of where your interests are carrying over yeah yeah we're still being a little bit coy a little secretive about what we're doing sure. but uh, certainly there are just aspects to the kinds of games that i've made and just the way that i like providing experiences for players that require a certain scale the scale isn't the point but the there are experiential aspects about being able to decide where you want to go. Having really great characters, but the reason that you care about the characters is because you actually get to interact with them and develop relationships, which also there's a required agency and choice involved in that. And I love to create huge universes for people to feel like they're immersed in and can explore. And it, it's the universe revealing its story to you over time that that's, I think, part of the, the DNA of that kind of experience, which is important too. So all of these things kind of have a certain scope required of them. And then for those reasons, that's kind of why we continue to be ambitious in what we're trying to build. But it's all in, in service of these things that I think are really important in what I love to play in a game and also then the kind of experience that I want to provide for people. I, you know, I'm, I'm picturing a lot of dialogue based on your, your text adventure comment. I, I guess I'm picturing some kind of like vehicle play, you know, because of like the Maka or the Normandy, but also fair to say you still care a lot about like the dialogue systems, things like that. Well, ultimately a dialogue system is really a means of interacting with characters and when you look at the games that I've worked on from Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic to Mass Effect 1 and 2 and 3, at each time, it felt like we were making something that was, I don't know, known or expected in some way. But what was happening was there was an evolution going on there. And so I think what people ideally will sense is there is continuity of the expectations that you're going to be able to decide where you want to go and you're going to meet amazing characters and develop relationships with them and have these kinds of interaction systems you know, whether it's dialogue or otherwise, but then to innovate each time. So that's certainly what we're looking to do here is thinking about what is the next version of the way we can interact with characters and what's going to feel fresh about that. Because in the spirit of creating magic for people, I think that's the real magic of video games is you combine the traditional arts, which are amazing in, in their own way of writing and art and music and character performances, you combine those traditional arts with technology that allows people to experience them in ways that they haven't quite done before. And when that happens, the reason it's magic is because you don't quite know how this new trick is being done. 
And then at some point, the making of stuff comes out and like all these stories of like, we learn how certain things were achieved in a game. Yeah. And then you then you kind of know. And so you know how the magic trick is done. But when you play the next thing and it brings in new innovations and you go, how are they doing that? How did that character know what I just did? And they, I thought, like, I thought the way that this works is you write a line of dialogue and then it's performed by an idol. But how did they know that I was going to do this? And then as soon as you start bringing in these new innovations and people don't really know how it's done, then you're back to creating magic again. And that to me, like all the best game experiences I've had are where for the first time I'm experiencing something that I've never quite had before even though it's it's made of these things that we already know and love in in art and music and things that delight us in in those traditional ways. I love that. Yeah, I mean, I think about whenever people give like a GDC talk like 2 years after the fact or something. It's kind of funny. It's like oh, you're showing like how the sausage was made, but I guess mm-hmm. it it forces you to then <laughs> reach for, you know, a little bit further next time. So that's a cool way to think about it. One of my favorite little artifacts of Kotor that I've seen is that little swoop racing arcade mini game. Mm-hmm. I think you basically and scribbled that as like a one page design doc with like bullet points and like yeah. sketch of what it would look like. Do you ever, do you ever work like that anymore? Is that something you still have done or? I, I do. Yeah, I absolutely do. And it's, you know, it's so much of what we do is it's sort of like multivariable designs or very visual kinds of things that we're trying to solve. So a lot of the way that I end up communicating with all the folks that I work with on the team tends to be visual. And so like, they're not getting great artwork out of me, but like, there's always like, sketches and like mock-ups of things and and it's really just about like trying to communicate an idea and even if it's something where i go okay what if this whole system worked this way and then you know i might do a a mock-up in photoshop and i might try to make it look real enough like the game so that we can understand what i'm saying but the outcome is not meant to be hey team this is what we're doing but this is an idea and now that we know exactly what the idea is that i'm talking about maybe an outcome is people go like oh i know exactly what you're talking about here's why that's a bad idea but then what if instead we do this other thing and yeah just so much of what we do is visual in that sense i still end up doing a lot of those kinds of drawings but now i mean i do have my this is my <laughs> humanoid uh, sketchbook And so most of it is in here, but also just in the way that we work now, uh, a lot of, a lot of it I do in like OneNote or Photoshop, I do more, you know, obviously digitally. Sure. I, uh, so I, I was sort of poking around the website and looking at the concept art. So you'll forgive me for this question, hopefully. But one of the images was titled Continuum. Is Continuum a working title or something like that? Or is it a location? Or We're, uh, we're, exper- yeah, we're experimenting with a lot of different titles right now. Okay. And uh, so we actually don't have one, but we have some potential ones, a working title, and then a lot of words that, you know, I, I always find with naming, you kind of stick a word on something and... And sometimes the first thing that comes to mind is the thing that you'll use. Sure. But you also kind of need something to kind of sit there for a while to be sure. And sometimes it's just like you don't like it at first. And then a month or two later, you still don't like it and it's not going anywhere. And so you realize you got to change it. But a lot of times you realize that actually we can't imagine it being anything else. And that was that was one thing that happened with KOTOR was, I remember at first, the character that is uh, Mission. Mission started out as a boy and it was originally the first concept was as a boy, Twi'lek. And then, and then later Mission became a girl. But for a while, I think there was a different name and or, or we didn't have a name. And then I got the first sort of like piece of a script from Drew that I was reading through in it and it had the name mission in it for the first time. And I literally, I put my hands on, on like my armrest of my chair to get up, to walk out to the next room to say like, I don't like the name mission, (laughs) but I stopped and I thought, no, this might be one of those things that grows on me. And so I just waited and sure enough, like, you know, a few weeks later, no, that's, that's what her name should be. There's some really great names in that game. I think Juhani and Bastila always stick in my head as like, you know, if you're going to name a character, like you should aim for that Juhani bar. That's a great name. Yeah. Well, and then I think all of them were named probably by between James and Drew. Yeah. But one of them I asked if I could name because apparently I had an imaginary friend when I was like three years old or something like that. And I had come up with the name Jolie Bindo. <laughs> and, I, you know, it's got a it's got a ring to it. It rolls off the tongue. And so... <laughs> 
So that's where we got the name for Jolie. I like that. Yeah, it's very fun. It's very, it's got <laughs> that like, yeah. It's got a little bit of Star Wars-y kind of Mandalorian vibe. Yeah, very George <laughs> Lucas. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then with Anthem, I imagine that's a title that like you guys probably had 20 titles for that game, right? And then Anthem just felt right at a certain point or how did that come up? So that one, I've only heard the story secondhand because I came into Anthem at the very end. Oh, sure. Yeah, because I was on that project at the very, it was basically, is that was going to be the next you know full game that I was going to work on right after um, Mass Effect 3. We moved on to what was going to be our new IP, and it was called Project Dylan at the time. And so I worked on Dylan for about a year before I left EA and was at Microsoft for a while. And then after a few years, that project was still going, and then it had actually been an announced as Anthem and had its uh, E3 debut. So they already had their name as of that point. And as I understand, that was another one where it's just, you try a number of different names and at this point, there are just so many things being copyright, copywritten, <laughs> that it's really hard to find a name that isn't, you know, blocked by an existing product. So but I thought that was a great name. Yeah, I love the name and the logo and all that stuff. I had a lot of that game. What, what would you say excites you most about, you know, at some point you're going to have this moment where you do kind of pull back the curtain on the next thing. Mm-hmm. And, you know, what are you kind of excited about with this project on like a creative level? As a, you know, as somebody who you want to show me the game, obviously, you know, that's a ways off. So like what's kind of exciting about sort of a, a new Well, era? I think what's really exciting about what we're doing is it is a little bit of an experiment in having the ability to really develop something that can be as true to itself as possible. And it is kind of what we enjoyed in the early days of Bioware as well is, I mean, we had a publisher and then Greg and Ray, and that's kind of like, generally, we didn't really even have that much interaction with the publisher. And it, was, it just really felt like we could just go off and design something that was true to itself and was amazing for what we were making. And, you know, I think as things get bigger in studios and publishers get bigger and bigger, it's harder and harder to do that. And so it's the the purity of just really thinking about what is going to make the best possible game experience and something that is true to itself, which I think that's the biggest marker of something that is going to be meaningful to people is that it really knows what it is. Everything in it, it really harmonizes to that. So that's what we're really trying to focus on is thinking about the essence of this experience and making everything really resonate. And I think the other thing is having done the games that I've worked on before, there are lots of creative paths that we've already been down many times. And so then the whole idea of doing something new, especially after all this time, is there we just want to find new creative paths to go down. So that's a lot of what we're building right now is at each stage, we kind of look down the road and we go, hey, we've been down there before. What's over here? What's off to the side? And then once we're on that different path, there's a whole different set of creative challenges and innovations that are required. And that's a lot of the fun that we're having. And you know, hopefully that's what players will experience. Awesome. I'm looking forward to it. Thanks for sharing. Thank you.